<laughs> oh god. And tape is rolling. Yeah. Well, we're here to talk about gay and lesbian activism in Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> history of. <laughs> and uh, we thought we'd start with uh, the 70s, um, or actually before the 70s. Gil's going to set the milieu of uh, <laughs> the community in the 60s, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm Gil Robinson, and um, I grew up in Tucker, went to Tucker High School. Um, I first found, about, found out about gay Atlantis and my uh, straight friends and myself, who was straight identified at the time, would come down to Atlanta and think we were real bright and sitting in a restaurant called Charlie's on 10th Street actually ordering um, Coca-Cola. To it. it was a notorious homosexual hangout yeah. with plate glass windows and everything. Plate glass windows? Right. There weren't too many. Um, I think there were just two or three gay bars back then. One was uh, the Tower on Angier, a women's bar, and Mrs. P's on Ponce de Leon, um, <clears throat> and another place called um, the Dupree. The Dupree's on uh, Ponce de Leon, where Ford Factory Square is now. Back then, people I knew in high school said, you better not go there. There's a mean dyke there that will beat you up. And years <laughs> later, when I grew up and came out and got to know them, um, I have quite a few lesbian friends. We'd be talking about where to go out to for drinks or whatnot, they would say, well, let's, someone would suggest do phrase and they would say, well, they have some pretty mean lesbians there, we better not go. <laughs> um, so is there any kind of activism going on, any kind of organization or political activity or anything like that? Not that I have first-hand knowledge of. Uh, I moved to San Francisco in 68. 68. Yeah, I was active in uh, Californians for Homosexual Freedom. And um, Bay Area Gay Liberation Front, and before that, a, a homophile organization called SUR, Society for Individual Rights. Which oh, in was, San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, it was a local San Francisco group that was modeled after the Mattachine Society and were very into them, having educational programs and trying mm -hmm. to reach some kind of a better understanding of, of um, homosexuals mm -hmm. where they were at. Um, I thought uh, the first organization that I know of was in '71, um, the Gay Liberation Front. Uh, and I, I came here, I didn't get to Atlanta until um, October of 71. And um, I remember meeting uh, Bill Smith, who was the, uh, I guess he was the co-chair of the Gay Liberation Fund. Um, and Charlie St. John came in 72. Uh, he was real active in it also. And then you, you were part of that, right? Of right, the, I came in 72. Okay, also. and you did too, I came right? in 72 also. 72, okay. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about the Gay Liberation Front, you know, just to sort of begin. Do you want to, do you remember, you remember Bill Smith? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Jimmy Calmorian for the introduction. And I guess I remember coming into GLF late in the uh, formation of the organization. And Bill Smith was over on this side in his coat and tie wanting to approach the legislature one by one and have us convince the legislature to pass, uh, I think they called it the, the bedroom law or something like that, uh, stating that in people's privacy they had the right to do whatever they wanted to. Uh, on the other end of the table was a uh, person, Severin, who uh, had the idea that going out into the streets and yelling and screaming and telling the whole world about his uh, pleasure in sex was the, ad, the way to convince everyone that being gay was okay. Uh, the first march I participated in, I believe, was actually a anti-war march at the time, and it was started at the uh, Civic Center and went down to the Capitol, and there at the Capitol we had a lot of other state speakers, I think primarily from New York, you know those Yankees always stir up the Southerners. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That was my uh, first experience in actually <coughs> protest. Uh, Max, and that you was might be able to join in a little bit on some of the personalities involved. That was in '72, right? Right, I yeah. believe so. Yeah. I've been. In, uh, my name is Max Clore. I've been involved with the gay movement since '70. Up in uh, Virginia, we had an organization called the Gay Alliance of the Roanoke Valley and I was with them for about 18 months before I moved down here. In fact, the reason I moved to Atlanta was because I was full of missionary spirit and I figured Atlanta being 
the hub of the Southeast, that it was also going to be the hub of gay activism. What I found was that <coughs> moving from a small city of about 100,000, Roanoke, Virginia, where our political meetings had an average of 250 to 300 people show up per meeting. I moved down to Atlanta and go to my first GLF meeting, and there's 25 people there, and it's a big meeting. Um, and pandemonium reigned constantly. There was constant struggles, personality, of ideology. Um, since David asked me to, to participate tonight, I've been thinking uh, a whole lot about those days and been thinking about things that I haven't thought about since they happened, things that I've wanted to put out of my mind, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> One of the really strange things about the organization when I came in is that it, the two co-chairs of the organization were a husband and wife a woman who admittedly had never had a sexual experience with another woman and her husband who would agree to be uh, sexually involved with men if there were other women involved. This uh, is Phil and Judy Lambert. Yeah, right? Phil and yeah. Judy Lambert. Okay. You've broken their anonymity. Oh well. Um, <laughs> They're not here, so. <laughs> that struck me as rather odd until um, I found out what was going on whenever there were any elections. The size of the group of 20 to 25 would swell to 40 to 50, and what would happen would be a large group of women that we'd never seen before would come in, and a large group of men would come in, and we'd have our elections. And then, amazingly, the men and the women would leave together as male-female couples. And I learned, uh, very early on that these were members of the Socialist Workers Party and the Young Socialist Alliance. And basically the uh, Gay Liberation Front was from the very beginning firmly under the thumb of this organization. Um, I was so enamored of radicalism uh, back then that I never questioned this. It's like these people are on the vanguard of the revolution and they realize that uh, sexism is the underlying cause of all social evils. Therefore, you know, I just didn't question any of this business. But I remember about my third month in that Judy, the, one of the co-chairs, asked a rabid black nationalist to speak to us and educate us on racism and we sat there like little sheep while he referred to us as hermaphrodites and um, scum on the face of the earth and nobody, including the so-called leaders of the community, um, said anything. And we sat there and took it, all in the name of political correctness. One of the other things that was real different from moving from Virginia down here was that there were definite leaders of the organization down here. One of the things that we stressed in the Gay Alliance of the Roanoke Valley was that we were a leaderless organization. The, a different person chaired every week. Uh, people just volunteered to do things that they wanted to do. One of the things that really grated on my ear when I moved down here too was this use of the word the gay community, like there is one gay community. One of the things that we also stressed up there that I think was a lot more sensible is that there are a lot of gay and lesbian communities of which there are some central issues. I think one of the big reasons that gay liberation has been such a failure in this country is that we have allowed ourselves to be co-opted by other movements. And we've, in many cases, completely lost the focus on, um, on central gay issues and gotten involved in, in as, as a quote-unquote community with leaders speaking for all of us, uh, involved in the anti-war movement, involved in women's issues, involved in racial issues, um, that from my point of view back then, you know, it was all one big revolution, um, but it didn't work. Uh, what being in the GLF and being a gay person in Atlanta 
and observing what's happened through the years has taught me is there's no sense in doing something over and over and over again if it doesn't work. Um, and I think I've run on that. Well, that's yeah. why, when you mention that, that's one of the things that I thought was interesting about getting us all together and maybe making this some kind of an ongoing project because it seems like people are always reinventing the wheel. And I've, I've, seen, I've seen this happen in organizations over the years. I mean, the kinds of things you're talking about where things that don't work and they keep on going down the same tunnel. And I think it'd be nice to have some kind of dialogue across the uh, um, generations, if you want to say, or something like that. Oh, anyway, I mean, so that people, you know, who are more active now, I mean, so that we can kind of be all talking to one another, all be in communication, you know, and that's one of the things I had in mind and maybe a larger purpose. Um, I, I have some, I have some more positive memories in some respects. Before you into that, can I make a few back uh -huh. comments about to whoever's watching this tape, there were a couple of other organizations, uh, several other organizations before this time in the 60s and even the 50s. One was called the Apollo Club, which was pro a social club for white men, white gay men mostly. They were, it was very closeted. They used to get together behind closed doors and have oh, brunch. Brunch. <laughs> Literally, yeah. And would cease all conversation when the waiter walked in and when the waiter walked out, they were starting, uh, unless they knew uh, According to John Howell, who's a member of it, uh -huh. he's now passed on. Uh -huh. There were also um, several uh, organizations, I understand, made up both of black men and black lesbians who, that were uh, travel clubs. I've been given to understand they would meet in different cities around the country and on their vacations and all get together and hang out and be openly gay in ways that they couldn't when they were back here in Atlanta. I don't know very much about them. I don't know that anything has been documented, but if anybody's watching this tape and wants to go for it, they might try digging there. Uh -huh. um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was Gay Pride in, in 72, um, because there was a small march in 71. I, don't, I wasn't here then. Uh, the newspaper says it was about 50, but that probably is a, an under, underestimate, you know, thanks to the Journal Constitution. But I remember real well the one in um, 72, we had about 300 people, and Bill Smith led the march. And um, it was, that was pretty courageous, actually, for him at the time, because he was working for um, the city, and, uh, and he was right out there. I mean, the camera really zoomed in on him, and he was leading us in all the chants and everything like that, and he was just on camera quite a bit. And uh, he said that he walked into... Um, he walked into work Monday morning in total silence, total <laughs> stony faces. He said he walked in, no one said a word. I mean, they didn't speak to him like all day. But he didn't care, you know, because he was doing what he wanted to do. And I remember that he and um, Judy uh, Lambert were interviewed on, uh, on television. Uh, they were on a TV talk show. And I was on a radio show with John Gill, who was the minister of MCC. It just uh, started, uh, MCC had started in early 72, and we did a radio interview on WREK radio at uh, Georgia Tech. Um, but um, I remember a lot of positive things about people getting out there and marching down the street. And 300 seemed like a big number. I mean, that seemed like it was an impressive accomplishment. And we were excited to, you know, to get on the media and you know, be able to be on you know, mainstream television and radio and talk about gay and lesbian issues. That was, that was an exciting thing. And I remember very much this schism in gay liberation um, I don't remember the socialist workers people coming in. I mean, I vaguely remember, you know, they would pack the meetings sometimes. But I remember that there was a real schism between Bill on the one hand, who made sure that we were incorporated as an organization, which I thought was strange. I'd been in Washington. I'd been going to college in Washington in the Gay Liberation Front up there. And we never, you know, incorporation never, never even crossed our minds. <laughs> you know, we never even discussed that. And Bill really had that zeal for more of the business-like and the incorporating and that kind of thing. And, uh, and then Severn, on the other hand, um, he, he, he did what he called cosmic drag, where he would have like, a, a, he would always have his mustache and hairy armpits and stuff like that, and then he would have an evening gown, and he would just sing these big songs, I'm tired of straight men fucking over me. And, and it, was, it was very exciting, and I enjoyed that a lot. You know, we, had, we would throw ourselves on the stage and scream and yell and carry on and everything, and it was, uh, it, and sometimes it was a very positive thing as far as, you know, releasing the expression and that kind of thing. Um, but I remember there was one meeting they had, I think towards the end of 72, that was a total, it's like a nuclear fallout. And he and Bill really finally went at it. They had a real direct confrontation. 
and and gay liberation wasn't the same after that. Um, that that uh, some people that people kind of sided with Severn and sided with Bill, and so the people that sided with uh, Severn basically left the organization. And um, I remember we just kind of limped along through '73 and had another Gay Pride Day, another Gay Pride March, and then and then the organization kind of fizzled out. So can, can I ask yeah. you something? Were there lesbians involved in GLF when, when you got involved? Or? From or time to time, um, there was also a big rift between uh, lesbians and gay men mm -hmm. also at the time. Um, Did that happen most at of a the GLF point meetings in time that you remember? Pardon? Did that happen at a particular t point in time that you remember? Constantly. <laughs> Constantly. Most GLF meetings ended, uh, began with reading of the minutes from the previous meeting, um, followed by a treasurer's report, followed by somebody wanting to bring up a motion condemning capitalism or condemning this or condemning that, followed by a group of five or six people getting up and storming out of the meeting. That's a typical GLF meeting. That was also pretty typical of uh, most of the early Southeastern gay conferences, too. <coughs> Large numbers of people were constantly getting up and storming out of Well, was it usually lesbians who got up and stormed out and the men Generally. stayed? I mean, is that what Generally. you're saying? Is that was something? My, my experience of it was that, was that that was the reason why Atlanta Lesbian Feminist Alliance started in, in 72, so that there really would be yeah. a, a real lesbian organization. There really was any go. communication. Bill Smith and I were neighbors, and we we're also members of the Cooking Collective. And uh, I remember one time that um, this was toward the end of 72, the beginning of 73, that Bill had come over to my apartment and sat down and he said, I've got a real problem. I've been talking to some people with the, um, what was the organization in D.C., um, the National... Gay Task Force. National Gay Task Force. Two of the people the National Gay Task Force, one of whose sister worked for the FBI and had found <coughs> out that there were two or three probable uh, Agent Provocateur in the Atlanta Lesbian Feminist Alliance. And Bill said, there's no way that we can go to Alpha with this information. A, they won't believe it, and B, we'll be totally trashed by them. So we never, I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing. We were so fearful of, of provoking anger from the lesbian community that there was no uh, exchange of information on what was potentially a very important issue. Uh, looking back on it, um, on what was constantly going on, it doesn't surprise me that there were plants all over the, the uh, gay movement. And it was something that until Bill brought it to my attention, that of course nobody, I never, I guess maybe I was naive, never considered that that was a possibility, that there were government plants in our organization. And yet I look back on it and see that there was constant turmoil going on. And, uh, you know, nobody in the name of political correctness was willing to say, you know, screw this, let's get on with business. Yeah, I think the FBI had just come out of dealing with all of the anti-war protests and were still dealing with that. And they saw this as a, something blossoming forth that they wanted to squelch in the nip or nip in the bud as the expression goes. Well, one of the parts that Gil was just mentioning to me, uh, Charlie St. John was real active in Gay Liberation Front, and he was, uh, he has a historical importance because he was the first person, first openly gay political appointee in Atlanta. Uh, Mayor Sam Massell appointed him to the Community Relations Commission, I think in late 72. And he and I were roommates from 72 through 73, uh, but um, I moved out in May, and then, and then in June, um, he uh, he was of course very active in Gay Pride, and he had he said he had made a speech at the Atlanta Jewish Community Center, and uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation kind of got on him, and what so what they did was they staged a raid on his apartment uh, uh, in uh, June of '73, uh, supposedly a drug raid, you know, looking for you know contraband and that kind of thing. And uh, as a result, the landlord forced him to move. He said, well, 
you know, we don't, we don't want this kind of thing in the apartment. So that might have been something you're talking about as far as, as far as government plants and provocation and that kind of thing. I mean, he was, he was, he was very definitely set up. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was ironic because, I mean, Charlie never did any drugs or alcohol, you know, at that time. But, um, um, I thought we'd, we'd kind of move on into like 73, 74, 75. Um, in 74 and 75, uh, once the Gay Liberation Front fizzled out, uh, as far as I know, there was not a Gay Pride Day in 74 and 75. There was not a, an actual demonstration. And I think that the main things that were going on were MCC was still meeting, um, and they they had several locations finally settled in the uh, Highland Theater on North Highland. And um, there's another. And Mayor Jackson appointed Bill Smith to the Community Relations Commission. And he also began publishing the bar. And you, you wrote for the bar. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you came back, what, in 74? October 75. October 75. Uh, okay. Yeah. And worked. Um, well, I came back to Atlanta from San Francisco, not intended to be here for too long. Mm -hmm. I'm still here. <laughs> Love these, what, 16 years 16 later? 16 years. Yeah. My roots are pretty much in the left, and we're pretty much in the left. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Emory for a year and was active in SOC there, Southern Students Organizing Committee, which well, was a precursor of SDS, the Students for Democratic Society. It got steamrolled uh, by um, SDS at one point after I left town. And was active in the, the um, anti-war movement in San Francisco and here. And my first demonstrations were in gay contingents in these huge anti-war movements, three and four hundred thousand people. Coming back to Atlanta was quite a shock. There wasn't very much political activity going on here. Yeah. And um, I got there wasn't really anything when you came back to town, right? And as far as organizations, as far as this wasn't any well, the liberation part. Yeah, the bars were the community back then. Yeah, and uh, the bar owners played a real pivotal role in, in the community. It was very different from the way things are now. It was, they were, you know, they acted like persons, whatever, bail bondsmen, uh, social worker, or whatnot. Yeah. Not only to their employees, yeah. but to their patrons as well. Since there was really no place else for people to go to turn for help. One of the things I wanted to point out when you mentioned that is, is I do recall in '72 being thrown out of the gay bars. Uh -huh, yeah. You know, when we were when we were trying to leaflet. I mean, oh, yeah. I remember in '72 we were uh -huh. we went to the Cove and we went to uh, Sweet Gumhead to leaflet about gay pride. I don't know if y'all were involved with that or not. But, but do you remember being thrown out? Oh, definitely. I mean, we were not allowed, you know, to go to a gay bar and tell other gays and lesbian, gays and lesbians about gay pride day. Uh -huh. And it's just, it's so, it's, it's, it's amazing now. I was talking to one of the guys who's involved with pride day and he said, well, things have changed so much. And, you know, back in the 70s, you were probably fighting for the right to have gays and lesbian, gay and lesbian parts. I thought, no, they were fighting us. They were throwing right, us right, out right. in our butts, you know. Yeah, I remember it very well. They were gay activists that had a social status about somewhere near street transvestites, <laughs> slightly lower. And the bar owners were really, you know, a lot of other people thought we were just needlessly stirring up trouble. Right, uh-huh. I remember I got a talking to from a lecture from a bar owner on that very subject. Was this in 75? Um, it was 76. A couple of years later, he was yeah. indicted for planning the murder of one of his Confederate bar owners. <laughs> we, knew, we knew about stirring up trouble, didn't we? Yeah, <laughs> takes all kinds. Shortly after I came back, I think it was in the, um, either the winter of 75, 76, or that spring, we started the um, Atlanta Gay Center in its first incarnation on 4th Street. Right. Bill Smith had rented some office space for the bar and wasn't using it, so we used to meet there on a, a couple of evenings a week. Um, you were involved in that, weren't you, Liz? Yeah, I got involved um, really through there was a poetry group. Right, right. Um, yeah. There right. had been a poetry group at Alpha, and um, there was a woman who wasn't real, I don't know, she had some problem with it and went to the Gay Center because the Gay Center existed, I guess, by 76 and started a poetry group, and I started um, going to those. Did you come here in 75 about it? I came here in 75 and I was 17. I called the Community Crisis Center, which was uh, no longer exists. It was a social service organization that was kind of street people or the whole hippie scene and come out of that. And they told me that uh, 
gay liberation front was long gone. I think right. I knew that word. I, I'd heard it on TV or something. Was, oh no, that's that's long gone. But there's something called alphabet. They're very radical women, and you know, I just we just don't <laughs> think that. I mean, you'd have to be very careful if you went over there. <laughs> so I saw something in Creative Loafing about um, this newspaper called The Barb that was a gay and lesbian newspaper, and I was interested in newspapers. So my first exposure to the gay community was in some basement of some print shop down by the stadium, bundling up the oh, bar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the world. I believe it was. Uh -huh. Mr. Ware. Mr. Ware was the only person that would print it the only, in Atlanta area. The Atlanta area, the only... Uh, Who's Mr. Ware? Uh, Carl Ware. Carl Ware? Uh, no, it's not Carl, it's something else. So he was the only person who was willing to print Yeah, well, stuff. he was the only person in the Atlanta area who had a web press that, on which the bar could be printed. Uh, the others thought it was just too too risky. They were afraid of being prosecuted and all sorts of other things. And on those occasions when we couldn't use that one, we had to go to a place. Um, I believe it was well to Macon one time, and uh, I had to shift it up to Monroe another time to get it printed. The Great Speckled Bird had to do the same thing. Yeah, I remember very well. Yeah, we should mention something about that because yeah. the Great Speckled Bird did really. It was a kind of a central thing in organizing it's true. Uh, uh, the gay community back then. Well, they had a whole, I, I found this, uh, I gave it to Southern Voice to reprint, but uh -huh. they have a, they, I found a whole centerfold spread they gave us in 72. They gave us the, you know, the centerfold for gay liberation. Uh -huh. um, and uh, but you kind of had to be politically correct at the same time, you know, so uh -huh. I mean, it wasn't, there wasn't any free lunch involved, you know. Uh -huh. I mean, you had, you had to sort of be, you know, yeah. militant and radical and inveighing against capitalism the whole time. I mean, it, it was kind of like one kind of party line. Uh -huh. You know, but it's still, I mean, it's, 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 it's funny when you look at it because uh, it's, uh, it looks real 60s, you know, with, with big, big daisies in the park, you know, with, you know next to our booth. <laughs> right. The bird was actually uh, by the, right before Gay Pride <coughs> in 73, there was um, a lot of infighting on in the staff of the bird about um, devoting a whole issue to gay rights. And consequently, uh, a large portion of the heterosexual staff walked, mm -hmm. and immediately there was an immediate influx of uh, gay staff writers. So probably by Gay Pride Day in '73, mm -hmm. Great Speckled Bird staff was about 90% gay, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. remained so for the next year or so. One of those people was Burl Boykin, right? Yeah, Burl yeah. was on there, yeah. and. What was the name of that? Uh, the guy who used to be in the Concats in San Francisco. London. Yeah. London Sadler. Oh, yeah. Yeah, London yeah. Sadler. Yeah. 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 I did yeah. movie reviews for them a couple of times. It was a great way to get my movies for you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But the Barb was the first openly gay, I mean, first... Well, there was one before that called Chanticleer. Oh, right. I saw a copy of it. It's kind of, I think it was short-lived, and it was pretty much bar-oriented. It was full of advertisements. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like an entertainment guide. Or, was it a newspaper, tabloid, or a magazine? Or it was a, a format of about, yeah, like a magazine, yeah. like this, about that size. Uh -huh. And uh, the uh, production quality wasn't the highest, I'm afraid. Who did it, do you know? I sure don't. Yeah. Uh, no, but, but it only lasted a couple of months. A few months, I don't know how long. The bar was around for a couple of years, I think. Uh, quite a few, Three, yeah. three years or uh, more? Or more. Yeah. The bar and Bill Smith, who owned it, were kind of, at the time, the, the hub of what was happening in the yeah. community. There was a house called the Bar House on uh, oh, right. Peachtree Place and, and um, Spring Street. Wasn't they it? just have a Spring Street, yeah. Uh, everybody who was, everything kind of sort of flowed through there at one time or another. Uh -huh. And it never made any money. Or not nearly enough. So there was a there was a young there's a an org, uh, an operation a corporation called Young Men Incorporated. I remember it was Atlanta Young Men. I forget which. It was owned and operated by none other than Bill Smith. And the profits from this escort agency were That's used to, to fund the make up the deficits in, in the, the bar, as well as to pay for this meeting space that the Atlanta Gay Center was in. The first one back on Fourth Street. Right. Right, so we were supported by there you have it. The dirt from the past. The past. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I thought we might talk a little bit about, about the gay center. Um, I was real glad when that came along because all of a sudden there were there were other kinds of opportunities mm -hmm. in addition to the bars. You know that that, that there were because we got a lot of I mean, we made a writers group going, 
and we, we kept doing the stuff of the poetry. And then we had we had dances there, and we had uh, all kinds of special interest. Uh, I think we we did some I don't know psychological stuff and mm-hmm. spiritual stuff mm-hmm. and things like that. And, and I remember it was a, it was a it's pretty much of a going concern for a while. Indoor I mean, street theater. Indoor street theater. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then, and then, and then it, it kind of tapered off the end of '76. Mm-hmm. It did. I think I'm yeah. tend to be more cultural focused than strictly political, like GLF had been, or um, the people who were involved in the Great Square of Yeah. One of the things that um, I noticed when I was doing some of the research is that uh, they finally did have a gay pride parade in '76 again. Mm-hmm. That Victor Host and Linda Regner put together under the Gay Rights Alliance. And it was interesting in looking at the history is that we, we had a lot of opposition um, when um, Mayor, um, Mayor Jack, uh, Jackson, Jackson mm-hmm. um, proclaimed Gay Pride Week. And then they formed this organization called the Citizens for Decent Atlanta, mm-hmm. um, and which took up full page ads in the newspaper mm-hmm. about, about, let's see, uh, berating acts against the moral laws of the Judeo Christian tradition. Right, right. Yeah, that was us. <laughs> that was us. We were doing it. We were breaking the mosaic tablets. But uh, <laughs> we were an anonymous group. Citizens for a Decent Atlanta would never say yeah. who they were. Well, we uncovered that there were seven, seven people, I think. One was Brown Tr- Trucking Company. One was um, Dillard Munford with Magic Weapons. Uh-huh. And uh, Reverend William Self of Why You Grow Baptist That's right. Church. That's right. So and we, we, and we, and we went there. there. We, we, went, we picketed uh-huh. Waiuka Road Baptist Church. Uh-huh. I remember we had a big picket, and then and then I and on a um, Sunday, and, on a Sunday. and Bob that Salo night. and several other people. I remember there was a woman who had a who had a child, you know, uh, in a baby carriage, and several other people. We, we went inside. We, we dressed up and went inside, you know, mm-hmm. to participate in the service. And it was very, it was extremely tense. <laughs> it was real. And self did not say a word about anything that was going on, mm-hmm. about what was happening outside, about our presence inside. Uh, but um, it was, it was interesting. That, I mean, that opposition, I think, you know, galvanized us mm-hmm. because there was more activity going on in '76 than there had been in about three years. Yeah, we started doing a letter writing campaign. We set up <coughs> tables out in the parking lots of gay bars, and uh, we right. had we stationery and stamps and pens and would suggest to people what they might write to Maynard Jackson right. to support him. Right. Um, mm-hmm. I guess maybe That's we're giving we away that. a secret. <laughs> 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 His early support of the gay community yeah. from the gay community was very contrived, but um, I think that was one of, uh, as far as I knew, one of the first real um, popular political things we realized we had to react to mm-hmm. this very Visible villain, you know these wealthy people who could run these full-page ads that were right. directly attacking us. So it was real different mm-hmm. than just a sodomy law or something kind of vague. Well, I found a copy of the Great Speckled Bird from that time, in the middle of '76, and they and they put us on the cover, the Citizens for a Decent Atlanta, and Margot George, uh, uh, she and and I don't know who the other guy was. They they wrote this article that investigated them and talked about who they were and what they were doing, what they were up to, why they were doing it. And uh, it's, it's, it really was most of the issue. It was it took up about half the issue. Okay. No, you have to say it again oh, about okay. the tights, right? I do. I start again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and say your comment. We yeah. were interrupted by the power going out because one of those FBI provocateurs obviously is downstairs, and I'm sure it was a male. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, one of the things I just wanted to, to comment too, in terms of cultural things that were going on, is that um, there, uh, a, an actor in Atlanta uh, who also is a director producer, Patrick Kukara, produced uh, Boys in the Band at the old Academy Theater up in um, Buckhead. Uh, it's a renovated church. And I think it was a first 
as far as I know, first openly gay male theater, I mean, despite the fact that it was boys in the band. But an interesting footnote is that John Schneider, who was in the Dukes of Hazard, played Cowboy in that production. <laughs> so, you know, you know, another great cu cultural contribution to Western civilization. All right. <laughs> the Dukes of Hazard had a lot of those contributions. The contributions, yeah. Well, I thought we'd move into 77. Well, we could about, talk about the, before we move into 67. Yeah, the Just make it breathe. Make it shout. Yeah. The, um, just as, well, at the time we didn't know it, but I think it marked one of the beginning of the revival of, or the start of the religious right in, in our country, and it was uh, the same sort of momentum that swept Anita Bryan into her height of glory the, the following year. The following year. I uh, saw, uh, fortuitously enough, this morning, uh, Mayor Jackson, our, who was mayor then, as mayor now, uh, held a press conference at which he signed the uh, proclamation proclaiming Gay Pride Day for this year, this morning at City Hall and uh, our wonderful new atrium down there. And mm -hmm. I don't think they'll be taking out full page ads. I reminded mm -hmm. him of that and he's, I asked him if he remembered it and he looked at me and said, I'll never forget it. I had 40 Baptist ministers <laughs> preaching against me from the pulpit. That's <laughs> right, that's right. They really did rise up. Yeah. yeah. Well, it all kind of died down later that year, right? I yeah. mean, it, it, it just seemed that it seemed to kind of wane away once, once Gay Pride Day was mm -hmm. over and because what they what they did is they uh, they went to court they were they tried to get uh, an injunction to, mm -hmm. uh, to to void the proclamation and then discovered legally they couldn't do that mm -hmm. you know but I think there was a big uproar at the time and then it just kind of and a lot of it I think was a political football too yeah you know so. interestingly enough Re Reverend Bill Self while you read that because it was being very homophobic at the time later turned out to be. And the, the, the recent squabble in the Southern Baptist Convention among the, the fundamentalists and the more moderates, he became a, one of the leading moderate figures, right. strangely That's enough. That's did. And retired a couple of years Let, ago. Let's go to the founding of First Tuesday okay. in 77. Uh, it is July 2nd, and, mm -hmm. and, and y'all, you, you both were involved with First Tuesday. I actually got involved in 78, so it was when I was founded when I Oh, when you, when you came in? Okay. We started, what do y'all want to talk about? We started in, in um, July of 77. The Dade County referendum was, had been in uh, June of 77, June 7th. And uh, a lot of us really didn't take Anita Bryant seriously when it came out. When she came out in um, January, I believe it was, and that's what was going to happen. We didn't, things had been going very well for the, the gay movement up until then, and we mm -hmm. sort of saw it as an increasing liberalization and progressiveness across the country. We okay. Until that defeat woke us up, we didn't think things like that could happen. We didn't take the religious right so seriously, but we did. Up until that time, there hadn't been a year-round gay or, or lesbian organization that was solely political in focus. We had the organizations that would kind of coalesce every day, or every year around Pride Day and put that on and kind of fall apart shortly thereafter. Periods of intense activity followed by months of nothing. Yeah. So uh, we, um, at, the f at that time, we, um, we decided to call it First Tuesday. Uh, Democratic uh, club or association since um, Democratic clubs in San Francisco, LA and other places were being very successful in um, bringing their, the gay agenda to the, the Democratic Party and into mainstream politics and so we thought that might be the ticket. Uh, we were, well, we were given the runner iron by the state Democratic Party. They didn't want to affiliate a separate group. Uh, they suggested that we go to the county Democratic committees, parties and their executive committees. We went to um, Fulton County. They weren't really enthused about it. Uh, they had, well, for a number, of, for two reasons. One is there was, of course, genuine homophobia there that we heard plenty of, but they had a more substantive reason. Up until just a few years prior to that, there had been two Democratic organizations in Fulton County, one black and one white, and they had just gone through a lot of um, internal problems in merging those two groups. And the last thing they wanted was yet another organization that was trying to, as they saw it, break off from uh, the rest of the, um, the mainstream of the Democratic Party. They encouraged us to run as individuals for seats on the executive committee of the Fulton County Democratic Party, and we did that. I think it was 77. Um, seven of us ran in uh, four or five House districts that were, they had, the party in Fulton County and in most counties then and still has six members, six posts in each house district. We um, campaigned almost solely in the gay bars and uh, the gay papers and the gay organizations. For We were interested in seeing if there was a gay vote there and, and if we got to it and if we could kind of motivate it and, through existing organizations such as the bars and 
and um, gay organizations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. We, uh, well, we were proud to say that after after the primary was over, two of us were elected. I was one of the persons, and Diane Stevenson was another. And we we could count. Um, what was it? I think one percent of the, the total votes cast were gay. We knew that for a fact, <laughs> and that was in uh, yeah. So tell so, yeah. tell tell me what what y'all what, what you you two were doing with First Tuesday. I mean, just whatever your involvement was. Or. Um, I don't know. I guess that 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 was kind of a. If you could break things into different periods, I mean, I guess there are a lot, but it seems very different from like Gay Liberation Front or something. It was definitely, the idea was that this would be about electoral politics, mm -hmm. that we'd, you know, even consider the Democratic Party, which in 77, a lot of people who were gay activists were very much to the left of the Democratic Party. They thought that was really selling out. And by the time First Tuesday was around for a few years, mostly there were. A, we heard a lot more from gay Republicans, I think. Mm -hmm. right? We just couldn't understand why. Why there were other issues like, you know, capitalism or feminism or why those things would ever be breathed in, in this organization. Was yeah. First Tuesday pretty equal as far as men and women? No. No, no. there were more men. Yeah. But it seemed at the time that there weren't any political women's groups that were interested in electoral politics. Mm -hmm. I might want to edit this out, but it seemed to me that Alpha was more of a consciousness raising group. Mm -hmm. And I felt like First Tuesday was the only gay political organization. Mm -hmm. um, there were a low percentage of people registered to vote in the gay community, and we had all these drives for that. Mm -hmm. Right after the bar. Voter registration yeah, drives at the bars. Yeah, yeah I remember very well. Well, something about the letter writing, getting people to register at the bars and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and when I got involved in 78, I don't remember that we had anything to do with the Democratic Party, though my memory fades. But No, we kind of dropped that. Uh, I mean, I think and, that we thought that the Democrats would be really glad to have us. And <laughs> the Democrats, yeah, I always considered it selling out because I thought the Democratic Party was too far to the right to be involved. Uh -huh. Well, I think I the Democratic Party in Georgia is very different from the Democratic Party in California, you know, yeah. that we just misunderstood things like that. Mm -hmm. And I know at some point we decided to change the name of the First Tuesday Association for Lesbian and Gay Rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you did. I guess that's, that that's in your history, 78 too. 78 or 79. Mm -hmm. True. The first Tuesday did become mm -hmm. a rather a, sober, a genteel sobriquet for lesbian or gay, for instance, when we would be talking to elected officials. They wouldn't want, they wouldn't want to say homosexual. They didn't quite know what to say. They didn't, weren't sure that gay was the right word at the time, so they would just say, is that a first Tuesday person or is so-and-so a first Tuesday person or whatnot? Yeah. I remember we, one of the main things we did was have candidates forms where we would uh -huh. invite people who were running for office. And that was very exciting. I think that the candidates had never been asked to do anything like that, and it seemed very brave for them to mm -hmm. come and solicit our votes. And, um, and take okay. them around to the bars to introduce them to people. That was the first time that anything like uh -huh. that happened. It seems to me that we were real involved in fighting police harassment of gays, too. And uh, earlier when you were talking about trying to think of an early incident that we remembered, I remembered that um, there was this big deal one time over the sports page. Um, some women, I think, got arrested because they went into the men's bathroom, but there were no men in the bar. So uh, instead of having a long line to, to the women's bathroom, some of them were going in the other bathroom. And there were a lot of police harassment then. So they were arrested in the bar? Yeah. 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 But undercover police or something? They had sent the fire department. You were, that was a favorite tactic was that uh, the fire department would come and say you were violating uh, the fire codes. Yeah. You know, on a Wednesday night when beer was accorded, they'd just shut down the bar. And they, they'd come to do that, and they found some women in the men's room and decided to make the most of it. But that was also at the time, I'm sorry, Judd's not here, because I thought yeah. he was speaking really well about how Rather than close the, the porno bookstores, they would just harass them out of business. They would just go in, the police would go in and really brutalize a lot of yeah. um, patrons. You know, there was no due process. It was just, uh, mm -hmm. well, I don't know, maybe you can speak. I remember an incident from back then, too, at uh, a bar on West Peachtree at uh, 13th. A woman was raped in the parking lot. And that sort of brought the, the issue of um, 
gave bashing and, and bar owners uh, responsibility to provide secure parking lots for their patrons. And we went on, a, went on a tear trying to get the bar owners to get security guards there because at the time they, there were none, there were no security guards there whatsoever. Um, mm. They took to hiring off-duty police officers, which became an issue on its own. Some of the, the police department was very con not real happy with some of the off-duty officers working um, in gay bars parking lots, and so they had to use off-duty sheriff's officers after a while. Mm. Um, one of the things that we did that was a first, I think, there was a lot of fun, was uh, we got um, uh, gay and lesbian delegates to the state convention in 78. That was very exciting. We uh, packed a caucus. They had them by state senatorial district and got a, quite a few of us in there. I don't remember how many, but we had John Howell and uh, Rex Matthews and me and um, quite a few others. Mary Davis, our city council member from the 6th district, was there too. Who she probably deserves a mention. She was the first candidate to really no no I'll take that back. Sweet. Second no 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 no. The first candidate to really go after the gay vote was um, a fellow named Mike Nichols who was running for House District uh, yeah. Twenty Seven. Oh, that must have been before my time. Yeah, it was seventy six. He came to the uh, old gay center in uh -huh. seventy six. Right, right. He was. I think he was the first uh, political candidate to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had a Republican opponent. It was the first term race to the same perspective. No one was running for re-election. He had a Republican opponent named Bill Baldwin who made the most of his gay support. And uh, it got really tacky. He would, would call him uh, Mikey at candidates forums and whatnot. Mm. I went to one up with Mike's mother and stood up to ask uh, Bill Baldwin a question about his homophobia. The first thing out of his mouth was, are you gay? And I said, yes. And Mike's mother stood up, yelled beside me, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> Are you just in the closet? Yeah. Um, there are two things but I want to Mike won at any rate. Yeah. That was a, a, okay. the first time uh, gay became an issue, in, um, or gay support became an issue in an electoral That's campaign. True, yeah. And we won, and that felt really, really good. We thought we could do anything. We tried to get Mike to introduce a sodomy law repeal, and he took the lay of the land as a first term freshman legislator down there and tried to back out of it as quickly as he could. It seemed to be overwhelming. That was the first of many sodomy law repeal attempts here. In, well, not the first. The first that we Wait, know of was in did, six Did yeah. Nichols do anything for us? I mean, when he was at in, did he, did, was he a, a gay rights supporter once he got in? Yeah, but uh, in terms of being any, able to do anything legislatively that was substantive. He wouldn't we, introduce anything? Uh, I don't believe he introduced a bill. If yeah. so, it never got anywhere. Mm -hmm. There, was, there were two things I wanted to, to mention, because you, you started talking about 78, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to, to touch on, I, in 77, the, the Anita Bryant thing really did mobilize the gay community a lot, and as I remember, there was a much larger Gay Pride Day as mm -hmm. a result, and one of the things that, that we did do that, that I found in the, the history was uh, on August 19th, 150 gays and lesbians and supporters picketed uh, the Miss National Teenager Pageant at uh, uh, the, the Memorial Arts Center, because uh, this you know, teenage beauty pageant, they had named Anita Bryan as America's greatest American. Mm -hmm. So we let them know we didn't like that. <laughs> that was about the time you changed your name, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was two years later when I started writing a lot of change for Bryant to Hayward, so you had to bring that out. Anyway, <laughs> everybody knows that anyway, it's no big secret. Um, you need to get Tom and Jeff up here for this. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to talk about too was, um, was uh, uh, James Moody, an activist, uh, I think he was from Pennsylvania. I don't know if people remember him. He, he moved to Atlanta, and, and, and he and I and Greg James uh, started uh, Gay Digest on WRFG, a uh, uh, gay lesbian radio show, which uh, there were women from Alpha who had been doing some shows on WRFG, but I think this was, I think this was the first weekly consistent show that, that was done. Um, um, and then also uh, Howard Bruner, who is an actor director, professional actor director, staged uh, Fortune in Men's Eyes at the Sweet Gum Head and also Hosanna at the Sweet Gum Head. And they were both very successful shows. I think that was some of the first, you know, first gay male openly gay theater. Um, so, should Jeff and the yeah, y'all want to talk about 70, 78, 79? Okay. Gil, would you mind just mentioning, you were about to mention. Um, some previous sodomy repeal. It was in 68, Yeah, the first one that, that I'm aware of was in 1968 when um, 
Uh, well, you see, Georgia's law was called a, a prohibited uh, the crime against nature. It didn't name sodomy. It didn't define sodomy. It was probably would probably have been found void for vagueness and unconstitutional if uh, anybody had challenged it. So in the course of revising the criminal code in 1968, as a young, um, I believe he was a state representative at the time named Pierre Howard, revised the sodomy code. He had a, an aide who I talked to later who was a um, libertarian, charismatic Christian who was very interested in, in repealing the sodomy law or working it out of the code, getting out of the code at that time when the whole thing was being revamped, rewritten so that to the present sodomy law, which defines sodomy very explicitly so there can be no doubt what kind of behavior, behavior is prohibited. That's the first time we know of. There is a case in 1939 in which the Georgia sodomy law was held to be not applicable to women because at the time it prohibited uh, a crime against nature as com or committed by man, with man, uh, with animal, or with woman, and mentioned nothing about women committing it. So uh, for quite a number of years we had a, and it that, wasn't enforceable against women. And that was argued by? Uh, yeah, but none other than um, J.B. Stoner. No, no, I'm sorry, James Venable, who was uh, uh, very big in the Ku Klux Klan later on in life and uh, lives in Stone Mountain. You have a remarkable memory, Jim. Yeah, you really do. <laughs> you really do. Yeah, do. Too remarkable. Something's best forgotten. Maybe, I don't know. Do you, do you uh, uh, Jeff and Tom, you want to talk about First Tuesday, 78, 79? Well, I, I remember coming into First Tuesday in 79. I had just moved to Atlanta, and I really wasn't an activist at all. I was tired of the bar scene and was looking for cute young men. I don't remember seeing. There were a few there. Yeah, few you had met one on the bus prior to Eric, the first Tuesday. Was, was uh, Gil was there. He was Gil cute. Gil was there. And young. Yeah. But I mentioned before. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I guess when I first came to the organization, they were yeah. they had they had just finished working. I guess on the state legislate the state elections, and there was kind of a lull and a lot of burnout. A lot of people were kind of trying to disappear. Or, Actually, they'd run up a, a huge debt for them, a couple thousand dollars. I think Ray Kluka, it was Coco, and he was personally financing the organization. I don't know where he got the money because he never had any money to be found yeah. somewhere. I was the other Coco coordinator. Yeah, you were the I other. know some of it was coming out of my waitressing, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About what was this? You said early 78, approximately? Mm, 79. You were there right about the beginning, though, weren't you? In uh, yeah, I or picked up on it in summer of 77, I guess uh -huh. within a few weeks after it had been yeah. founded. With James Dixon and John Wyatt. That's right. Former roommates. Uh -huh. <laughs> Those were fun times. We they had a lot of fun together. Um, I think the most remarkable thing we accomplished, as was said before, were the candidate forums. Uh, those were, were very exciting. Mm -hmm. They were. They're it made a big difference in the perception of, of gay folks and their ability to, to attract voters, generate votes, get candidates down there. But it was, I know, uh, at that time, I guess, when uh, Ray and Liz quit as the co-coordinators or their terms expired, they deigned, designed, didn't want to run again, they, uh, they talked me into running. and. Gloria Tatum? Was, did she That's what I have Gloria. to repeat. Right. It's what I, I wasn't there at the meeting where Gloria said, um, I, I think I'm well qualified for this position. Um, although I'm new to the gay community, I have been a member of the Radical Fringe for a year. <laughs> 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 and horrified a lot of the oh, yeah, we had, mainstream. We had a good number of yeah. Republicans and organizations. Yeah. And Beth was a big Citizens Party person. Yeah, and true. Beth took over editing our newsletter, The Healthy Closet, which was really a nice little newsletter for yeah. a while. Uh, Tom Hoff, well, I guess our secretary, treasurer, one of those things. And I still remember the, making the mistake of letting Tom and Beth work on the newsletter together. <laughs> and they butted heads like raging yeah, bulls. Yeah, we were they, at each other's throats. Oh, they time. were. That was. They edit each other's articles and cut out different <laughs> sentences and put a little snide <laughs> remarks to each other. Quite <laughs> <laughs> a few of them got into print. Yeah. 
Yes, I had it for a few didn't months. Didn't we have too. viewpoints, and one of us would do one viewpoint and one the other viewpoint? Uh -huh. Where is he? It sounds he appropriate. Try to get him here. Uh, he was. He was gonna. He was gonna. He has to work, right? Next work. Yeah, right. yeah. But uh, and I just did. We did a couple of fun fundraisers. We did a a gong show at a bar, Arnie, a lesbian bar that's since long gone. Uh, I thought we did it at Crazy Rays. We did one at Crazy Rays too. We did a couple of fun. I never, we never raised very much money, but we all seemed to raise enough to keep on going. And uh, just the 81 city elections are the ones that I really remember doing a lot of work. I put a lot of time in on them. Absolutely floored. We had candidates for them. That was and John Sweet City John, Council. John Sweet City Council, Mary Davis, uh, John Lewis running for Congress. I remember taking John Lewis around to the bars and John was just fascinated. He corralled these, it was the Fall Library, he corralled a bunch of people at the bar and started talking to them and they didn't know quite what to make of him. It all went bounce on the table. Uh, he, uh, but he had just a great time and he about wore me out about three o'clock in the morning. I was ready to go home and mm -hmm. he, was, he was going strong. He was going to the late night place we got to. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember candidates out drinking me at the Cove more, on more than one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> they would last longer than I would at 4 a.m. at the Cove and yeah, be ready to go to the, hit the churches the next Sunday morning for their early services. I recall yeah, going, out Mary, yeah, going out campaigning with Mary Davis a lot and one time being in, in Pease. And that was um, back when that, that one little back room Mary got kind of kicky. And thinking, well, I really want Mary to see this, and no, I'm kind of always steering clear of that area. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I wanted, I wanted to see if people remembered was in 78, two major things, the Southeast Gay and Lesbian Conference, first time it was in Atlanta, at the Georgian Terrace and at the Fox, mm -hmm. and also the big Anita Bryant demonstration at the World Congress Center. Mm -hmm. And and the peop I like people to, to kind of talk about that because that that, yeah, that was I remember that really vividly. Yeah, Not that I too. organized it, but I was a just one of those marshals. You know, I wore an armband and kept people in the street or something. And I was right at the front, and it was the first time I'd been involved in gay rights for a couple of years. And somehow we were marching toward the Omni, and we couldn't really see who was there. We didn't know what was going on, but it was the first time that I. And I came in later than like people in the early 70s. I was really afraid. Yeah. You know, for all I knew, the Baptists had baseball bats and were ready to break our heads up. And I mean, there was definitely that feeling because Anita Bryant, I think, you know, it's funny people don't remember, not, not everybody knows what Anita Bryant did, but she was saying very ugly things about us. Yes, and was. I think we were really afraid and really angry. and. Um, and like you said, no one had ever suspected it. I mean, I was young, I was like 17, and I thought things were getting more and more liberal, and as soon as people heard our rational arguments for gay rights, everything would just magically change, and Anita Bryant was really... One of the biggest things she did was, I mean, calling an organization Save Our Children, and it was the whole idea of gay teachers, and trying to make sure there were no, you know, especially, I don't know if she addressed lesbians, particularly in terms of being teachers, but she certainly did where gay men were concerned. You know, and keep them out of the schools and out of the classrooms and away from the children. And I mean, that whole save our children became quite a rallying point. It seemed like that just really stirred things up. But, uh, but I, in the, the newspapers, they say about 2,000, but people say there were a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I noticed too, I thought was important about it, was that it was the first time that I'd seen in Atlanta where there was a real widespread um, rallying, that it was not just gay people and lesbians <coughs> marching for gay people and lesbians. It was, it, we, had, we had a vast array of a lot of different people. I think a lot of the religious organizations were part of a lot of the different human rights organizations, the feminist groups, uh, women's groups, you know, just, I think, workers' groups. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was it was an enormous demonstration. It was, it was very diversified, very widespread. Mm -hmm. And then Maria did her, I remember she, she got up there when we were in front of the World Congress Center, and, and her opening line was, I come to you today as a defiant dyke. And people went wild. They went crazy. I mean, there was like you know, a ten-minute demonstration of screaming and yelling and you know, roaring, and it was it was very. So we were afraid that we were actually going to see Anita because at one point it was like you know she's going to come walking through there you know to get into the World Congress Center, and it was and there was such a ferocity there because things were so polarized, and and I was really afraid that if she if if we saw her 
there was definitely going to be an act of violence, and people were going to surge towards her, and there was, and then, 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 then all hell was going to break loose. But they got her in the side door, so that didn't happen. <laughs> but, but then, of course, there was a lot of confrontation between, the, between us and the Baptists who were walking into the convention hall. Yeah, you know, and, and there was there was a lot of there was a lot of mostly mostly verbal. And verbal. Yes, there on the sidewalk, religion met reality. <laughs> religion met reality. Met reality. We, we raised so much money for to put on that demonstration. <coughs> People were so enthused that we raised more money than we needed, and we had a few thousand dollars left over. And that was it turned out to be the seed money that we used to establish the gay center, right. the new gay center, the old one that had been on Fourth Street, it kind of uh, falling apart. Fall apart. And uh, who was it? Frank Sheeran, Diane Stevenson. Me, um, was Linda Rager involved? In that? Ray Kluka. Yeah, yeah, Ray was Getting involved together. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was the first demonstration I went to, and I was, you know, so new on the scene. All I could think of that was that my pastor from Bremen, Georgia, at the Baptist Church, was going to see me and his wife and his kids, and so it was uh, very exciting. To be discovered, perhaps. and that was your first demonstration. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's a it was a real big, wild, raucous one. For yeah, first it was great fun. It yeah. was. It was great fun. It was very exciting. I was. I was. I was scared though that there was going to be a lot of violence. I mean, I was, it was. I was it was. It was, it was it exciting. <laughs> but, well, I mean, I didn't. I, I wanted. I mean, I wanted to confront those Baptists and everything, and I did. You know, but I. But I didn't. I didn't want to get into like you know dismemberment. You know, I wasn't looking forward to that. <laughs> some will just really shy. Yes, yeah, just you know, just, you know, well, Were you involved in the fairy circle back then, or did that come later? That was uh, really started with the southeastern uh, conference. As far as I knew, I mean, that's when it really uh, gathered more people. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, a caucus at the. Uh, at the conference, uh -huh. and people right. was that with Fagala? Yeah. Uh, yes. And uh, Michael was it? Michael? Michael Wilson. Yes. Who owned the land up in North Carolina? <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the running water farm. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there was just a lot of curiosity about what these very strange people are doing, and so I know our little group from West Georgia. We had a consciousness raising group and came up for the for the conference. We just were sort of peeking in the door to see you know, what these people in dresses were doing, but of course there were weird yeah. things going on in all of the rooms, so that was just one one of them. But it seemed to gather more uh, interest over the uh, over the next few months. But what I remember about that conference more than anything else was the terrible confrontations between That's the right. men and the women talking about. So. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, getting mad and stalking out, mm -hmm. and then it, it upset me so much. Some of it was was uh, men versus women. Um, the first big walkout was basically with some of the uh, more religious organizations, right. Dignity and Integrity. Mm -hmm. They they stormed out fairly early on. Um, to provide some background for this, that was in fact the third such conference that happened. The first two were held in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. The first in uh, April of 1976. I was the founder and coordinator of it. We had 300 the first year and around six or 700 the second year. Totally turned Chapel Hill upside down. We had an if you're gay, wear blue jeans day, uh -huh. which on a college campus you know, caused quite a lot of chaos. And um, <laughs> while we certainly had a lot of, of sexual divisions within the group, by the time of the third year, when it came to Atlanta, that was when everything really broke loose. And I think that we managed to sort of get it all together by the time the conference finally came along. But um, there was certainly a lot of, of moaning and wailing and gnashing of the teeth along the way, and the ERA got rolled into it, and it was quite a uh, situation. Wasn't there some, though? Big battle at the. There was some kind of wrap up or plenary session. Uh, I, re remember I remember. That? I remember that. The, I remember we had a meeting. It was in early '78, and Frank Frank Abbott was part of it, and uh, uh, Terry Barfield, mm -hmm. and Leif Sandberg, uh, Heidi Silver, S Estella Ella. Were That's part right. Of it. it was over at their um, apartment on Fourth Street. I remember. I remember. <laughs> Well, I remember we, we were meeting. I think it was. I think it was at the Georgian Terrace. I think it's. Yeah. I remember. I think we were meeting there as a, in a preliminary session, and and some of the women wanted to have women only workshops, 
And most of us didn't have any problem with that, but some of the people in the religious, the people in the religious groups did. And I think it was, I think that was just a pretext. I mean, it was a, it was, it was a, and I remember Frank Sharon was, was a big part of that. Um, and I'm not saying he was the, you know, person responsible, but he, he certainly seemed to push the issue. And then some of the women were really adamant about uh, having, um, you know, women only workshops. Uh, and there was a woman, Dini. Douglas, Dini Dudley, Dini Dudley mm -hmm. who was part of Dignity, who was who was who was speaking for for that position, for Frank's position, as far as not having women-only workshops, mm -hmm. and she was saying that if it was the gyneco gynecological workshop and there was a male gynecologist who wanted to come, he should be able to come. Anyway, you know, sure. and it just it just got into it just got into a mess, and so finally, what happened? I remember Bob Sigmund was there. And he was doing a lot of the new games and everything like that. And he took us through all these different new games. And it was great because the ice was broken. We were getting to know each other. A lot of the politically oriented people didn't know the religiously oriented people and, and vice versa. And so, and so we did these things where we were broken up. And there was all this good feeling. And then the issue came up again. And people immediately went down on the positions that had already taken. And the upshot of it was that the religious groups walked out of the conference and Frank said, I will do anything in my power to make you fail, to make sure it doesn't work, you know. And Leif Sandberg and Terry Barfield stood up there and held each other and shook and cried and wept and there was this big outpouring. And then when the conference actually happened, none of those things happened. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all, it was all kind of um, sound and fury. So. There was quite a bit of that. I'm, I'm thinking back, I'm amazed that first Tuesday it held it together as long as it did. Because we had so many, I don't know that it was that diverse, but we had certainly gay religious people who were among the most conservative in the community at the time. And Howard um, Waters, was, um, and Howard Wells was the MCC minister. He was very involved in getting it together. He was very, very conservative. Well, by other people's standards who were involved in it, a fellow named Howard Walters, who's the owner of the uh, New Order bar here in town, uh, was also very conservative. Uh, there were some people to the to the left of Beth for a while, but nonetheless, we seemed to, I don't know how, but stayed together for what, three years? I mean, five years or so? Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I guess maybe we stayed busy. I, I, that's my personal <laughs> formula for success is if you, if you really have issues, you know, you just, that stuff gets swept under the yeah. rug and you go on to something else. It also helps a lot to have a very good enemy. And that was one reason why Anita Bryant was actually so wonderful for us. I think in terms of sheer numbers, that protest against her was probably the largest ever gay mm -hmm. gathering in Atlanta. Today. I really mm -hmm. seriously doubt that any of the gay pride parades in all those years have ever had as many people. That that is the largest? Yeah. I think another thing perhaps is that we seem to have had more of a sense of humor about ourselves than, oh, yeah. than, than some people have now or had before then. Mm -hmm. I don't think we took ourselves too seriously, by and large. I remember laughing about a lot of things. We had running gags about various sorts of things. Well, there was more to laugh about. This is true. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know I perceived some change from the beginning of First Tuesday till the time, I don't know, 82 or something, that I quit being involved. I, that it seemed like more and more people were getting involved who were, um, even though we, we're interested in mainstream politics. Like you say, we were one step below, I don't know, street prostitutes or transvestites or something. I mean, no one who was involved at the beginning, I think, really thought that they were going to become the... Um, aspiring mainstream. Aspiring mainstream. Would get any respect uh -huh. for being a gay rights activist. It was the last thing on their minds. It was... Um, yeah, it wasn't even on the agenda, it wasn't even on the table. Yeah, and um, well, uh, Bill, I, Bill Smith I think had by the early ages, people about that, thought it though. was going to get him somewhere, mm -hmm. personally. I, I mean, I, I recall that, that Bill was concerned about some of those things, about, you know, respectability mm -hmm. and, and all that kind of thing. But, that, but, but that, at the same time, he was outrageous. I mean, he was yeah, writing he Young was, Man Incorporated and all right. that stuff. That's true. You know? yeah, that's true. That's business. <laughs> that's business. <laughs> that's a respected commercial enterprise. <laughs> Well, you know, it, when, when you talk about the change in, in attitude and everything, when, when I first got involved in, in 71 and 72 in gay liberation, I remember that there was, I mean, sometimes it could be extreme humorlessness mm -hmm. about, you know, because a lot of it was so rhetorical, sexism, ageism, racism, classism, we need to, you know, transcend all those different things and everything like that. And, and I remember that, I mean, and we were very separate a lot from uh, other gay men 
because, because we were speaking a language that I remember I was involved with MCC when they first started, and they were doing a male beauty pageant. And I remember I started talking to them about saying, well, you know, this really is a very sexist activity that you're undertaking, and total blankness. I mean, people did not, that, you know, they, what, huh, you know, huh, what? And I sort of felt compelled to say that, you know, and, and, and didn't, really, didn't really believe it myself. But, uh, but uh, one of the things that I found, though, is that, is that um, I did get a lot out of the cell groups that we had in Gay Liberation, where we had these weekly cell groups consciousness raising sessions. And there were a lot of things that I, the things that I had been studying in, in Washington when I was in Gay Liberation Front in Washington and took further and then also, I mean, it was, it was just as much uh, personal therapy as it was political consciousness raising. But a lot of that is, has really sustained me. I've been aware ever since then of, you know, when, when things are sexist, racist, ageist, and, 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 and not, to, not to be uh, didactic about it, but just to be able to, you know, to, to identify that and, and say, well, you know, these things don't really have any credence because they're based on, you know, because somebody is older or somebody is younger or somebody is black or somebody is white or somebody is male or female, somebody is straight, somebody is gay and, you know, better thans or lesser thans and that kind of thing. And I know it sustained me a lot in, in activism. It's just, just kind of a philosophy to draw upon, to, to come from. I was thinking of moving into um, 79 and kind of like you know, maybe closing this around 1980 or something. And if people could talk about, um, um, well, there was an, the organization for the National March on Washington, the mm -hmm. first National March yeah. on Washington. And Ray Kluka was a big part of that. And his housemates, Eva uh, Salzer and Elizabeth Monahan, and then my lover, Greg James. That was and, a very um, exciting time. We, were, yeah. we went to the, the planning session. The first one <coughs> was in uh, Philadelphia. Yeah. And we met in, um, I think, or some religious hall. I think it was a Society of Friends. Religious meeting hall was very old and historic, and it was total pandemonium. It was chaos. There were hundreds of delegates, and each the procedure that had been set up broke down in a matter of minutes. So what happened was there were people standing in line waiting to use the microphone from all over the country, with divergent points of views. Who some of them didn't want the march desperately, some of them didn't. Some wanted various folk to make sure people were included. Out of that chaos, something got um, something happened. It was probably the first national gay organization that, that really had some kind of organic growing up to it about it. Uh, unlike the, there were other national organizations before that time, but they had started in New York or Washington or various other places and tried to send folk out to the hinterlands or, or made some kind of a half-hearted approach to it. Um, we, those of us from Atlanta quickly discovered what we call rampant bicoastalism, that is persons from California and New York tending to uh, dominate the committees and so on and so forth. So we made the, we had geographical parity became our issue and we broke the, uh, the country down into regions and made sure that we had uh, equal representation from all of the, the regions. Um, on the National Steering Committee we would have, uh, we had another meeting in Houston that also planned it. Usually we could, uh, were in touch by uh, telephone hookup, conference calls with um, usually 20 to 30 um, very impassioned homosexuals across the country on one conference call. They were, it was um, new adventures in the communications industry. Well, it was the first time we really were in touch with each other nationally. Yeah. You know, more than just regionally or just locally. Yes. Kind of thing, um, you know? We had, what, I think uh, 250, 300,000 people at the march in October mm. 79. I remember going up to the Washington Monument looking afterwards at the Lincoln uh, Memorial and seeing the place just crowded, packed with gay people. It was marvelous. It was um, the highlight of my career up to date. Mm -hmm. What were the numbers that were reported in the press for that march? It seemed like it was grossly under uh, underestimated. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it was. How much of that was our fault, though? I, I mean, how much publicity and, and, and pre-publicity was there with the straight media? You know, I sometimes wonder if in, in the course of, of organizing, maybe not just that, but, but gay events in general, mm -hmm. no one even bothers to call up the local newspapers and uh, you know, TV stations and, and let them know that, hey, you know, you got a, you got a news story here. Well, I, I know that there's a lot of bias. I mean, you can, you can, because I've done that for organizations and, you know, I've worked in media myself and 
and you can you can let them know as much as possible, and you can and you can try to be as as savvy as you can and as mediagenic, you know, and give them the news hooks, news pegs, news angles, and stuff like that. And a lot of times they still don't respond because because it's basically the you know prevailing culture. I mean the the you know ma uh, mainstream let's say values, and, it, and there's there's still a lot of prejudice and bias, and then. And then they'll say, "Well, it's not really a news story, you know. It's or it's not. It's not a big news story. It's a. It's a. You know. It's a peripheral news story, or it's a sideline news story, or something yeah. like that." Just, know? just as an aside, this is being taped in early June of '91. It's a few weeks away to the um, gay march here. I've been impressed that of all the time I've been in Atlanta, this is probably the best advance. Publicity I've mm. seen for any gay march. Whoever came up with the uh, the notion of six slash twenty three it was absolutely brilliant. Mm. Nice catchy, easy thing to remember. I haven't had any involvement with this group. I just wonder how much of this uh, you know straight media attention is, is being paid to. Because after all, I mean they're the ones who give us coverage on local TV and in the local paper, and and that ultimately, unfortunately is how most gay people end up knowing anything about these events. It's usually after the fact yeah. in a you know, 30 second clip on the news. What I was curious about that I'd like to bring out um, is we're talking about pre-AIDS and post-AIDS and, and, and I was wondering if people had some perspective on 79 and, and the planning for the March on Washington and the whole national gay lesbian political agenda and the difference between then and now, or you know, then and and then just getting into the AIDS, because because that's I mean that seems to be real that's a real demarcation yeah, line. Yeah, I looked at the um, what the demands were, the the focus of that. I looked at that like five years later from from that march, and yeah. there yet yeah, nothing about AIDS or sexual. No, because there wasn't there wasn't it. Was wasn't it. Eerie. Yeah. But Reagan was running. At that That's time. true. It was. So it was that was a very strange year. I, I remember, you know, it, it, we thought maybe gay people were going to be shipped off to. <laughs> well, because, I, I mean, we really right. didn't know. There was some very heated a, rhetoric, and and I think a lot of people didn't know what to expect. And I have a real vivid memory of that of of, of being at the the um, I think it was the Hyatt Riviera on, on Peachtree Street, you know, going towards Buckhead, and it was election night in 1980. And uh, and we were watching Reagan be elected, and then all the different uh, liberal senators like Frank Church and Birch Bayh also also oh, being being defeated. I mean, it was it was that whole massive kind of thing. And it was and and as people said, well, it doesn't mean anything because you know it's the presidency, and, and people don't like Jimmy Carter, so a lot of it's a vote against against Carter personally. So we need to look at Congress and see what's happening there, and then. And then all the liberal senators were falling like dominoes. And then, and then uh, one of the things that people kept saying to each other all night long, and then as they were leaving, was, "Well, see you in the camps. Yeah. See you in the camps." You know, because we, I mean, we thought, you know, okay, well, Reagan's in. It's you know, concentration camp time. And and, it, and then of course, AIDS started. And then there's a lot of talk about quarantine. You know, so, and that, that same election was interesting here in Atlanta, um, locally, because uh, in the race for House District 27 that encompassed a lot of Midtown. It doesn't exist now. It's been districted out. It wasn't in um, 82. Uh, a woman named Cindy Fuller was running. She had been Mike Nichols' aide who we supported in 76 against Bill Baldwin. Cindy had um, come to some of the early First Tuesday meetings and gave us some suggestions and advice on how to go about organize, organizing ourselves to touch base with the Democratic Party and how best to deal with it. Uh, Mike did not run again. He. Um, he was starting a family and his wife were having children and moving to Houston. So Cindy Fuller, his aide, ran. And uh, she got the Democratic nomination. But, uh, and someone else named George Armbrister got the Republican nomination. Oh, the right. House District 27 was interesting in that it encompassed most of Midtown, but it also went out to the Northwest to the, the more fluent, fluent um, uh, white um, upper and uh, middle, upper, upper middle class neighborhoods uh, that very night. What was interesting about the race was that George Armbruster was a, a gay man. He right. was closeted, though, and it presented us with a real, with something of a perplexing dilemma in that George did not want to come out. He was a Republican. Many of the, the folks couldn't see themselves supporting Republicans. 
However, George got some support from the gay, his friends in the gay community by word of mouth. First Tuesday wound up supporting um, Cindy Fuller, a straight woman, a Democrat over a, a gay, uh, a closeted gay man. It was one of the, the other uh, election campaigns that we were involved in, I think. It's safe to say that. Yeah, just, just as an aside to that, uh, it was roughly about that same time, I don't exactly remember what year, but it was when Slow Frank Harris ran for governor against uh -huh. Bob Bell. And I don't know whose idea it was, but Bob Bell had some people out campaigning in the gay bars. Uh -huh. And yes, I remember. I was, I was there. Yeah. And I remember walking into the voting booth that year, and for the first time in my life, voting for a Republican. Uh -huh. And it was such a, you know, an emotionally wrenching experience. <laughs> like, How can I do this? I know what you mean. My hands were <laughs> about to put both on to get the little punch all through the thing. What year was that? Um, 82. 82. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're, we're sort of at a completion point as far as the 70s go. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention just kind of as a, as a coda, I guess, that uh, in April 1980, Bill Smith uh, died of a drug mm -hmm. overdose. And um, I've wondered about that in terms of somebody who is a real zealous activist who burns out, um, and uh, what that might what that might indicate or mean or whatever. I mean, I think I think we ought to take care of ourselves mm -hmm. personally. But on the other hand, um, I mean, I've noticed a lot of people do get real strung out on activism. Well, it wasn't really that. You see, Bill Bill finally folded the bar up. Um, after several years of not making too much money on it as a publication. He went into business with a fellow from Philadelphia named Mark Siegel, and the, who had a, a paper in Philadelphia called uh, the Philadelphia Gay News, or The Gay News, and Mark was trying to start a chain of them across the country um, in various um, cities that had enough of a gay population to start it. He started one here in Atlanta called um, Southern Gay News, I believe it was, or Southeastern Gay News, he um, was in partnership with Bill Smith. Um, I think the idea that uh, was that Mark would provide some of the logistical support and some of the uh, financial backing, and Bill and the people who had been involved in the, the bar would do uh, most of the legwork here in Atlanta. Uh, Bill, Bill at the time was on the uh, Community Relations Commission and also on the board of the ACLU of Georgia. He was, I believe, the first gay and only gay man to be on there for quite a while. <laughs> the ACLU, I, I guess we should mention parenthetically, did a whole lot to help us out back then. Mm -hmm. Gene Guerrero was the director of it and he was out there fighting away for causes that a lot, of, such as um, the mistreatment of um, male hustlers on, on the street or whatnot, that a lot of gay people would not feel comfortable at all advocating advocating on, on behalf of. At any rate, um, Bill uh, had a falling out with um, Mark Siegel. Um, Mark told me later at the um, Houston meeting of the um, organizing committee, the National Steering Committee for the 79 National March on Washington, that he had done um, about this. He, there was some misunderstanding about of a financial nature, I understand, and, and um, was told that uh, the mayor was informed that Bill was running an escort service, and um, Bill um, <coughs> feared that he would be arrested shortly thereafter that, after that, so he divested himself of the young men at Atlanta, the escort service. He resigned from the board of the ACLU of Georgia, he resigned from the Community Relations Commission, and, uh, suggested that they retain other gay folk to take his place. He was afraid he was going to be removed? Oh, he was afraid he was be, would be arrested for his escort service. Oh, arrested. So he um, decided to... Right. He went and tried to go into business time. at the time, um, working for the bar owners and doing some sort of community relations, public relations work for them, and helping them out with their the police problems that would be, that were ever-present, um, that they, they really needed him or someone like him to help them out with um, that we've mentioned the fire marshals coming in and checking for overcrowding conditions and so on and so forth. Um, Bill seemed to be take things really hard that what he had been doing with the bar or with the paper and with uh, the CRC and with the um, 
the board of the ACLU was very, very uh, meaningful to him. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot of very good things that nobody else could, was doing, probably nobody else could do at the time. So when he gave those things up um, under this pressure, he just sort of, his lifestyle sort of changed about that time. Mm -hmm. And it was a few months after that that he was found dead of a drug overdose at, uh, in the parking lot at Northside Hospital. Right. But yeah, I think he was a real victim of the, um, the viciousness and the infighting that seems to have been a part of our community for the last 22 years, to my certain knowledge. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's something that I, I, I did want to address, too, because, because that, I mean, you just need to deal with that in some way. I, I think a lot of times, um, you know, we are our own worst enemies. And, and it, it seems to me that, that all that, I was struck when I was working on the history of um, the consistency of the charges that are brought against us, you know, is that basically coming down to that we're degenerates, you know, and that, and that we're, we're, you know, just, you know, sort of inherently immoral. And, and, uh, and so people use all kinds of reasons, you know, it's like, well, because God doesn't like it and because either that or, or, or strictly moral kind of thing, but we don't, you know, they, they, people are still able to get away with using personal arguments against us. You know, that it's not truly a civil rights issue, that this is a matter of choice, that these people are, you know, morally uh, decrepit or, you know, weak or something like that. And, uh, and I think it seems to me that in looking at the different things that happened in the, over the years in the community, that, that, um, that social condemnation that we receive, that we'll, we'll take that out on ourselves and on one another. And, and, that there's, and that there can be a lot of, um, a lot of that backbiting that goes on. On the other hand, when I was looking over the material too, I saw how when, when you know, push comes to shove, we actually are able to get together as far as, uh, as, far as things like the Anita Bryant, the March of the World Congress Center, um, in front of the, uh, the, the city council when they were you know, voting down the ordinance that they had against, against discrimination against gays and people rallying together for that and in front of the Center for Disease Control and around AIDS, around the quilt, um, that there are times when we do come together and it seems that you mentioned that if we have a powerful enemy... Yeah, we, need, we need an yeah. adversary that is right. greater than the perceived adversary of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any last thing anybody wants to say? Or it was a lovely to? decade. You should it was a lovely there. decade. You should have been there. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Wait, hold on. Oh, wait, do you want to say no, something? I just hope at some point uh, we could go in more to the uh, like social. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, let's do it right now. Tell us about social things. So the fairy surf one, which all did. No, I'm really right. all tired right now. One, one thing, is it on tape that this is by no means a representative or inclusive group yeah. speaking tonight at all? And yeah. um, hopefully this will be a catalyst for other people to make their own tapes or say their piece or in, on videotape. Well, it would be interesting with, with the... the, um, with the the Gamma, the Gamma group, Greg Worthy and, yeah. and, and Theo yeah. and people like that. Because because okay, there was a there was an article that I found in The Advocate in January of eighty one mm -hmm. and uh, he was interviewed and uh, Margaret well Margo Margo George from Alpha was interviewed but also Greg and, and Theo and, and talking about Gamma and and, and Marsha Davenport and be interesting to you know, have, have some of those people, you know, because... There's a lot of people. There's lots and lots. Yeah. Hundreds. I think we're complete. <laughs> Thank you all table. very much. <laughs> we had a tape about an hour ago. <laughs> an hour ago. Is there too a lot to tell? Can, 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 we, can we get out of here for just a second? I just wanted to... Uh, everybody, I just... No.